we're increasing our prosperity. And in just about all the ways that I can think of that matter, we are leaving a lighter footprint on the planet Earth. Wow, that is a bunch of nonsense. Roger that. Look, I get it, Andrew McAfee. You're at Harvard, MIT. But do you really have any idea what you're talking about? Next on the Growth Busters podcast, nonsense about decoupling. Calling, 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 calling. Call the Growth Buster. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Welcome to the Growth Busters podcast. Here we discuss our society's addiction to growth, and we do our best to chart a sustainable course for human civilization. Why? Because we've got a planet to save. I'm Dave Gardner, director of the documentary Growth Busters, Hooked on Growth, and self-described expert on sustainable living. And I'm Erica Arias, social researcher, sustainability advocate, and co-hoster of the Growth Busters podcast. For cutting edge information about our culture's unsustainable love affair with growth and what we can do about it, be sure to visit growthbusters.org. Well, Erica, as you know, I like to share a little bit of listener feedback at the beginning of these uh, episodes, and I've got a couple of comments that I thought were worth sharing. So let's get into that. And while I'm thinking about it, if you have some comments on this episode, there's really four ways you can get your opinion in front of our eyes. Uh, One is you can just send an email to podcast at growthbusters.org. You can also make a comment at uh, the Growth Busters Facebook page or the Growth Busters podcast. Facebook page, or you can add a comment in the show notes to this episode at uh, growthbusters.org. So I got an email from someone in the land down under, Lise Blackgrove. Forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your first name correctly. Uh, She wrote, thanks for doing your podcast. I listen to it in Australia, and I absolutely agree with most of what I hear. I just wanted to recommend a book for you to read, if you've not already. It's called Green Illusions by Ozzy Zayner. I read it a few years back, and it really opened my eyes as to what our impact of completely changing our energy and transport, et cetera, sectors are. It also gives some more sustainable ways to live. I think you could get a lot of good information from it. Thanks again for your efforts, and keep up the great work. I have already subscribed for emails a while ago. Cheers. So thanks, Elise, for writing in. I read the book and even chatted with the author, Ozzy Zayner, uh, a couple of times back when it was published in 2012. And uh, it is a good book. I would recommend it. The, the main point of the book really is that decarbonizing our energy supply is not a panacea. That's not going to solve all of our problems. And in fact, it's probably not even going to solve the climate disruption problem because according to Ozzy and a number of other experts, we won't be able to build the infrastructure and generate uh, energy from renewables at the level that we are currently getting energy from oil, coal, and natural gas. Now, there's some debate on that out there. There are some people who believe that we can do that. But Ozzy put together some pretty compelling evidence to indicate that uh, if we want to shift to renewables, and I think we do, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. That we're going to have to kind of ease up on the gas pedal a little bit. And we especially are going to have to get over our obsession with economic growth because that just drives ever and ever more of an appetite for energy. It goes hand in hand. Yeah. And here's an interesting note related to Ozzy. So so I'm really glad that you did bring him up. He co-produced a documentary that is just going to be coming to your town sometime in the next 12 months, hopefully. It premiered in August at the Traverse City Film Festival, and it's called Planet of the Humans. And it actually, you know, kind of digs into that same subject, uh, only in a bigger and deeper way. And... I have pretty high hopes for the film. I haven't seen it yet, but uh, it was executive produced by Michael Moore. That means it's uh, got a half, halfway decent chance of, of actually getting some theatrical distribution and won't just depend on community screenings to get out there. So watch for it. Planet of the Humans. Very neat. I'll have to check that out. Yep. Keep an eye out. And uh, probably we'll end up inviting the producer of the film, Jeff Gibbs, maybe Jeff and Ozzy to come on to the Growth Busters podcast when that film really is starting to be seen. It would probably make good sense to do an interview with them. Totally. 
One more quick uh, bit of listener feedback in response to our last episode, episode 34, which was titled Coming Out as Child Free. Larry in Wenatchee, Washington, emailed and wrote, I typically advocate a maximum two-child family or two children per woman, what with all the changing of partners going on. (laughs) (laughs) Obviously. (laughs) Yeah, just tickles me, isn't it? That's great. (laughs) Obviously, two children is replacement. But if two's the max, barring twins, with the second pregnancy, while many will choose to have none or one, we'd get that reduction and bust growth in the process. And there would be a much better chance of recruiting religious leaders, media, and politicians to support a two-child policy as opposed to one child. Realize that just asking folks to volunteer to have none or one child won't go very far, whereas the limit of two would be way more acceptable to the masses and hopefully could be accepted as the norm at some point down the road. Keep up your good work. Well, what do you think about that, Erica? Uh, I mean, I like the two child. Okay, two child, if that's going to be your policy, I don't think you should limit it to per woman. I think it should be like per family. So hopefully nobody's entering into a relationship where they're, you know, relationships end. I get that. The families change over time and people split up. I get that. But if you already have two children, I think that requires a little bit more thought before having two more children with your next partner. That's just kind of where I'm, I'm coming from. I don't, I don't really disagree with anything else he had to say, but I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> I have some thoughts about that too. But first of all, I do want to say thank you very much for listening and writing, Larry. And I also want to mention we're not really suggesting or promoting a policy because I don't really use that word. The, that word policy brings up a lot of baggage. Uh, you know, it reminds people of China's one-child policy, which was not a good idea and was not executed uh, humanely at all. We're just recommending. We're recommending small family decisions. So the question is, is suggesting one-child families too extreme? You know, Larry thinks that that's just, uh, you know, we're not going to get very much acceptance because that's going to be considered too extreme. And there was a time when I thought that. In fact, if you look back, if you go get into your Wayback Machine and you look at all the Growth Busters videos and communication that I was doing 10 years ago, I was pretty much saying two child families, stop it too. But I think we've kind of moved on. And I think that there's enough conversation today about whether young couples should even have any children at all, knowing what they know. You know, I would like to think that suggesting one child families wouldn't be considered quite so out there. Yeah. And I completely agree with you about that, Dave. I I think staying away from the word policy is important for this conversation. It's really just about making sure that people are thinking about the decision to bring life into the world critically and not just doing it because of social pressures or um, because it's just the next stage in their life or, you know, whatever other reason. It really does require some time and consideration to think about what what that means, not just for your own lives, but for the future of the world and the rest of humanity, your community. And yeah, yeah so yeah. it's coming from a place of concern. And and I, I think that's, that's important. I don't think there's anything coercive about that at all. Oh, that's true. But Larry, it's not a matter of uh, us being right and you wrong or you being right and us wrong. I mean, it's just kind of a... <laughs> There's a spectrum of opinion about that. And uh, so I appreciate your input. And uh, But I thought it would be good for us to explain why we might not be taking your advice on that one. <laughs> but keep <laughs> writing. Appreciate that. Thanks, Larry. Are we ready for the main event? I think we are. Yeah. So uh, it's been a little while since we last recorded our child-free episode, so we have a lot to unpack, Dave. We've kind of just been looking at some current stories in the news, and I'd like to first begin with an article coming from BBC's chief environment correspondent, Justin Rolat, in an article titled, Climate Change Action, We Can't All Be Greta, But Your Choices Have a Ripple Effect. Yeah, I'm glad you want to talk about that, because obviously we talk about Greta almost every episode. She's getting a lot of attention, so... Yeah. What did you find interesting about this BBC piece? 
Well, it's really cool because Rolat gets a chance to interview her and ask, you know, some million dollar questions. Uh, one being, what is the point of her causing this ruckus? And two, is this really all just to make us feel guilty? And really what I appreciated about that interview is that Greta refers to her actions as more of a signal to spread a message that will hopefully influence uh, further action and kind of awaken the people who are asleep to the climate crisis um, and to really just push a political movement. So she adds that something that really resonated with me, which is that it's not her job to make people feel guilty and it's not her job to make anybody do anything. What she's trying to do is just inspire uh, an ethical responsibility in all of us to make a change in our actions and to really care about the planet. And uh, as an, ins uh, an aspiring social scientist, I personally pay a lot of attention to social mechanisms that influence our decisions. And I talked a little bit about that on our last episode and just social factors that influence our reproductive decision making and our attitudes. And so I think whether we're talking about changing our environmental attitudes, our reproductive attitudes and decisions, social influence and, and specifically social pressure and contagions and norms just either encourage us or discourage us from moving in one direction or another. So it's an important, it's an important aspect in looking at the way that we want to change the world. It's, it's, it's important. And but what did you think about it? Well, I thought there were some interesting things about it, including touching on largely on what you're talking about. And I think it's worth a chat because there have been a number of influencers out there lately and commentaries in the media who have been, for some reason, trying to convince us that individual action is just a distraction and that the more we try to encourage individuals to make uh, good choices about uh, streamlining their footprint, that the, the that sort of gives a pass to governments and big corporations and the system that really needs to be changed. And so I really do think we want to talk about that because you probably know this already, Erica, because you're present on every episode. But I really tend to side with Greta. I think individual actions matter a lot. And I grab every opportunity to kind of explain that. Justin got my attention right off the bat in his piece, and we'll include a link in the show notes where he wrote, is individual action pointless in the face of climate change? Let's not beat around the bush. The simple answer has to be yes. Yes, that individual action is pointless. That's what he wrote. That's how he started. So that got my attention because I thought, okay, I'm going to have to... <laughs> correct the record here. But of course, by the time he gets to the end of the piece, I think he's sort of come around. But he's making a good point. He's making a lousy point that I think we should help him to tear apart. Because his next sentence is, think about it. What difference does one person foregoing a lamb chop for a lentil bake, deciding to catch the bus rather than take their car, or deciding not to jet off for that autumn getaway in the Balearics? make. I don't know where that is. It's got to be an English thing. <laughs> if the other 7.7 .7 billion of us humans here on earth don't do anything, because I was pretty much quoting him, I guess I have to actually quote the number. He didn't say 7.7 .7 billion. He said 7,699,999,999 of us. I guess he was being cute there. <laughs> I guess, yeah, like you can look at it like that if you're looking at immediate um, change. Um, no, you're probably not going to see a global change from uh, not eating a steak for dinner tonight. But it's about being the change that you want to see, right? And spreading that message. Like one person's action could influence the person next to you, whether that's a family member, a friend, um, a politician. I don't, I don't know where, where you live or, or, you know, who you're around, but it's, it's about spreading that message and that's contagious. And so if you're, you know, an, a vegan and an, an environmental activist and you are around people who are not, that's probably going to feel a little bit like you're always in opposition with the world, but you might actually change somebody's mind. And especially if you're vocal about your points and starting these conversations about why you are and why you've chosen to live your life this way, then 
then yeah, like change can happen. I mean, you've seen it with every major political movement, every major change. Me Too comes to mind. And it all started with one, you know, one or a small group of people coming forward and talking about something that just wasn't openly uh, discussed. And now look at it, everybody's talking about it. So I very much believe that the ripple effect with all of this, it, it, it starts with one little change that just sort of inspires other people to change. I agree with you 100%, but I just think that's half of it, that whole element of bystander behavior and, and peer influence. And that is that if all the people around you are, or more and more people around you are behaving more responsibly about their footprint, then you're a lot more likely to kind of feel, oh, I guess that's what we're doing now and do that. <laughs> but but I think it goes even beyond that, because think about if if 7.7 .7 billion people do the calculus that Justin Rowlett described, and they reach that conclusion that, no, I, I'm not going to make any difference, then, yeah, it would be a logical conclusion to say, yeah, why bother, other than the idea of setting a, an example. But what I want to propose is what if 10 or 20 percent of the world's 7.7 .7 billion people decide to forgo the lamb chop or decide to catch the bus or decide to skip the jet trip? What if a significant percentage, maybe not all 7.7 .7 billion, but what if a billion of them make that decision? Then it makes a huge difference. Absolutely. Yeah. But if everybody makes this lousy calculation that he described at the beginning of the piece, then yeah, it's not going to happen. So I think it does a disservice to us to continue to tell people not to expect the best from everybody. Right. You know, because that's kind of what they're saying. They're saying, well, nobody else is going to do the right thing. So why should you bother to do it? Yeah. And, and big changes take time. And it's actually funny that you say that, Dave, because they had some pretty interesting stats from the article as well from uh, Dr. Professor Callie Fielding at the University of Queensland, Brisbane, Australia. Why am I not surprised? Great. Another great researcher coming from Australia. The survey found that 69% of Americans wanted the government to take aggressive action to combat climate change, but only a third were willing to pay $100 to make this happen. So what that basically tells us is that 60% of Americans uh, recognize the problem, but they expect somebody else to fix it. This is important because it basically tells us that we are lacking in responsibility and we just don't think it's our responsibility or we don't think that we can have that much of uh, an effect on uh this big of a problem. But big problems like this require a lot of people to take action. Like you by yourself are not going to solve it. And it's really about just getting a group of people to do that. And how do you do that? Well, you have to be the change that you want to see. I think that's how that starts. Well, I'll play devil's advocate here and say, well, people <laughs> are just too, they're too selfish. They're too self-centered. They're too busy. You know, that's why we need government regulation. We need to all get together as a society and decide to put a price tag on uh, a carbon footprint, for example. We're going to need regulations. We're going to need to take away their options. We cannot count on people to voluntarily, you know, give up their car, to voluntarily walk or ride a bike or use public transportation. And <laughs> to some extent, that's true. But the more you say it, the more you believe it. It's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think that's kind of what's gotten human civilization into the cellar today is because for a hundred years or more, you know, we've been telling ourselves that we're terrible. Human beings are terrible. We're selfish creatures. We're not selfless. And we've come to believe that. And so doing the right thing you know how it is. You don't hear too many elected representatives say, oh, well, I'm going to vote this way because that's the right thing to do. Right. It's always, well, I'm going to vote for that thing because I want to get reelected. <laughs> right. <Such laughs> bullshit. I don't disagree. I don't think uh, a carbon tax, I, I'm kind of for that. I think, you know, it, just the way that we're going right now, it doesn't seem like such a bad idea. But I also know that there is a huge push for interdisciplinary work in academic institutions and really uh, drawing together ethical departments, environmental policy, and social departments to kind of approach these bigger problems so that we can look at them from multiple angles. It's not enough to 
look at climate change from a purely environmental standpoint and say, this is how we're going to solve the problem. So I'm very much of a fan of tying these two together, social and environmental perspectives and and really looking at this problem as like a bigger issue and like, what's our motivation and why are we not motivated to do more when we see it? as a problem. Like this is a one of the greatest threats to humanity, but people for some reason don't care. And it's easy to say, yes, we're all self-serving and we're only going to do things when it directly affects us. But I think there's more to the picture there. I And there's so much we don't know yet about our motivations and what seems to be our lack of uh, responsibility for this problem. Well, and one more thing, Erica, you and I both live in the United States and, and definitely in the United States, uh, our policymakers are way behind the curve. I mean, you know, why don't we have carbon pricing? You know, we don't have much help at all from the system to encourage us to have much smaller carbon footprints. I think they look around and they see what our behavior is and they evaluate what they think we want, what they think we'll tolerate in the way of regulation. So they're looking around at all these people who aren't making responsible decisions about their footprint because they aren't being encouraged to. And in fact, they're being told, no, just sit on your lazy butt and wait for the system to change. It's the system that has to change. Well, the system isn't changing because it's looking at everybody and saying, that doesn't look to me like they want system change. (laughs) Imagine a world where, you know, where the halls of Congress were populated with people who grew up in families and and in neighborhoods and went to school where everybody around them was making responsible decisions about their footprint. It would be so much easier for them to enact good policy. Right. Right. It starts at the home. And how many times have you heard me say that? You can't say it enough times, Dave. (laughs) Don't encourage me. This article, while I was reading it, just instantly reminded me of an episode I listened to on Sam Harris's podcast title uh, called Making Sense. If you're familiar with it, I highly recommend it. If you're not, he interviews Andrew McAfee about the history of human progress and the modern uncoupling of our prosperity from resource consumption. And Dave, you also sent me a review of McAfee's new book titled More From Less, The Surprising Story of How We Learn to Prosper from Fewer Resources and What Happens Next. For our listeners who aren't familiar with McAfee's work, he has his background in engineering and received his MBA at MIT and has his PhD from the Harvard Business School. I would call him one of the optimists of our time. Really, he's an intelligent guy and um, is uh, an expert in his field. Sort of similar to Steven Pinker, kind of uh, reminds me of him a little bit. The episode started out pretty like positive. Everything that was said in the very beginning reminded me of things that we would say here, Dave, and just really highlighting the dark side of the industrial revolution and how there used to be a time when there was a huge trade-off between our prosperity and the health of the environment. But now we've sort of moved from this capitalistic cookie monster model into where we're at now, uh, thanks to the computer and all of the other technological advancements that have sort of just allowed us to be more efficient and to get more by using less. And getting more of them using less is, you know, even though we're capitalism is motivated by making a profit, making more money, it's also motivated by saving. So that's kind of the essence of, of what he's trying to say. But without spoiling too much of this episode, I think everybody, our listeners should still listen to it. And we'll share a link at the end. But this conversation naturally transitioned into the topic of climate change. And McAfee describes it as, quote, not an obvious today problem, and the greatest knocks are going to be decades down the road. I really wasn't happy with this statement because what I gathered from that statement, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, is that we and the developed world aren't seeing or experiencing the effects of overshoot. And in my opinion, that's coming from a very privileged standpoint that I don't think was intentional, but this position is just so widespread and normalized. And I think in large part explains why people aren't as engaged in taking more action in the way that we would hope. Thank you for saying that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Nobody brings that up. I thought I was the only one thinking that. (laughs) So you disagree. So you believe that uh, just because you're uh, one of the billion richest people on earth, that doesn't mean you're not going to suffer some severe consequences of climate disruption. 
And the crisis is so complex that how can we be certain that we're not going to experience these effects in several decades? It could be within a decade or less. We really don't know. It's, yeah. it's, we just can't predict yeah. it. It certainly doesn't help the cause for getting people activated to do something about it. If you're telling them, well, it's going to be a problem, but not for you. It doesn't help. No. <laughs> but yeah. But it is going to be a problem for you. Yeah. I really like that he supports the idea of having a carbon tax and, you know, other really positive things um, that he had to say. He's definitely an optimist, but I felt like he was just downplaying the fact that we are an overshoot. And his book just strongly supports the notion that it is possible for capitalism and sustainability to coexist. But I, I, I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't, I don't agree with that. When you first started telling us about this uh, interview, this podcast episode, it sounded to me like you were kind of going along with it, that you felt like he was like he was right, that uh, we have figured out how to decouple economic growth from environmental devastation. <laughs> well, I was trying to to highlight the good parts before telling you the bad. So I think he had a lot of great things to say. Um, I mean, mainly that the world cannot handle another industrial revolution. And he really advocates for trying to help other nations that are not developed yet. So really getting them access to technologies that we didn't have while we were going through the struggle of becoming, you know, the America that we are today. But with that, he, you know, believes that we need to get them in quote, we need to help them get richer. And I don't think that should be our goal. We definitely want to get them out of poverty. That's really at the core of everything that we're trying to do, Dave. I, I think, you know, poverty is something that we all care about and that we want to see eradicated. But yeah. I don't think getting people richer is going to solve that problem. You know, that Notion. I'm glad you brought that up. I definitely wanted to talk about that. That is founded on one of his most fundamental misassumptions that we have got to correct. And I think you're being way too charitable. Yeah, he said a few things, but really, I think we ought to set fire to that podcast episode. It is so dangerous. And his book. We're going to have to have a book burning, Erica. Sorry. Um, like... because, I mean, it is, this notion he is trying to put forward that we can innovate our way out of this crisis, that we have figured out uh, how to have prosperity without our ecosystems paying the price. And that's really what he has said. Now, I haven't read his book, so I got to take this with a grain of salt, but he seems to be saying that we have completely decoupled uh, economic throughput from environmental impact. And there are certainly some optimists out there, to put it nicely, who <laughs> believe that. But there is just really no evidence that we've really managed to do that. And some really smart people out there are telling us, no, it's not true. We're getting faked out. Number one, anytime somebody says, look at how we've kind of plateaued our energy usage in the US or our carbon, uh, you know, our actual carbon emissions, actually, there was one year or two where they went down. But I think in the most recent year, they started climbing again. But when they point to that, what they're overlooking is the fact that we have exported a lot of our footprint, you know, half the stuff that we're using is made in China, those carbon emissions, and that energy use isn't being put on the books for us, even though it is part of our footprint. For one thing. And Dave, he makes an effort to also make the distinction that everything that he's saying is not polyanistic and that he is optimistic and there is a difference. So while I think it is important to note that there have been some really great advancements that define our progress as a species, including increased life expectancy, declining poverty overall, and reduced maternal and child mortality in the U.S. and other places. But these are still problems in other parts of the world. And, you know, all of that said, technological progress and capitalism has also led to more social and economic inequality, depression, deaths by despair political polarization, a lot of really bad things too. So I think he kind of downplays those bad things and really just focuses on all the good things. Like, yes, it's wonderful that we have clean water and sanitation, 
But even that's not <laughs> entirely true. Look at Flint, Michigan. Um, they, so yes, we are in a better off. And the way that he does it too is very clever, really, really highlighting those positives, right? Because it's hard to argue that we are in a better place than we were decades ago. It's it's just true. That is absolutely true. Like you and I are, you know, we have clean water. We have the antibiotic that's, you know, going to not work for us in due time, hopefully not soon. We have access to food and education and we have whatever government we have right now. You know, things are arguably better, these are good things. Like, it's hard to argue that like, sure, these are wins, but this is here. This is in the United States. This isn't in India where there are water shortages. This isn't in Africa. This isn't in other parts of the world. And this Flint, Michigan, even parts here where we are still seeing people who just don't have access to education, don't have access to reproductive health care. I think we still have a lot of work to do. Yeah, well, and I think, you know, he said he's in a hurry for the poor to get rich, which, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't burn his book if he said we're in a hurry for the poor to have good lives. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, he honestly believes that if they get rich, that they will be able to afford to clean up the mess that all of this prosperity creates. And he is, you know, he's got blinders on if he thinks that we are really successfully taking care of business here in the overdeveloped world. He also says something that kind of stuck out to me too on the episode, which was that other developing nations should have access to the technology that we didn't have. And we're not going to just give it to them because we're altruistic, but they're going to demand it. But do they have the power to demand it is the question. I mean, a lot of these developing nations just don't have the power because if they did, they would already have access to it. And Well, the world's not going to give it up. No. It's not going to let them. It's not going to let them. But he believes it will because he's really in denial of the true footprint of all of this prosperity that we're having here in the overdeveloped world. A uh, great example is he and Sam discussed the Green Revolution and, you know, the invention of artificial fertilizer and how a huge number of people wouldn't be alive today if we didn't have that. Well, guess what, Andrew McAfee? Look at the unintended consequences of that. That is largely responsible for the climate disruption that you do admit is a problem that we need to work on. It is primarily responsible for vast ocean dead zones. It is primarily responsible for major rivers and aquifers being depleted. Species extinction. Species extinction. Fertile soil, the loss of fertile soil. That one example that you brought up, Andrew McAfee, that's not going to last. That is doing more damage than good, and it cannot last. So technology is going to fail you. It is not going to put food on your table. And Sam kind of adds to that. So he seems to be in agreement with McAfee and says towards the end that yeah. it's not a competition between our prosperity and environmental health and that those can to be simultaneously uh, occurring things. And that's just not the case. I mean, if it were, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. It, it, I don't want to even call it a competition, but there's an interdependency there on our health and the environment. And if one goes, the other one goes, and it's a chaotic relationship at this point. So, Yeah. And fortunately, our listeners are interested in our opinions, so we're giving them, but that's probably not enough. I mean, you're probably sitting there wondering right about now, well, geez, who died and made Erica and Dave experts on this? This Andrew McAfee guy, he gets a book published, several books published, and is on the faculty at MIT. He might know a little bit more than Dave and Erica. So I want to offer up a little bit of uh, helpful evidence. And I think what I'm going to do is include, we'll, we'll include a link to this podcast interview that I would prefer to burn. We'll give you a link because we think you're smart enough to know bullshit when you hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also going to include a link to uh, a great piece at resilience.org titled Decoupling is Dead, Long Live Degrowth. And it's a really short read, but it makes a pretty good case for why you shouldn't believe somebody when they tell you that we can have unending prosperity of the type that he's discussing, you know, that require ever increasing amounts of economic throughput. 
that we can have that without destroying the planet that we live on. This short piece at resilience.org actually includes a link to it and we'll include a link too, is actually talking about a, a real serious uh, academic study that this author was a part of to examine whether decoupling could keep up. We've seen a little bit of decoupling. All the experts agree you can have a little bit of decoupling, but it's going to get harder and harder to uh, divorce the impact of continued additional quote unquote prosperity from the impact on the planet. And I'm just going to run down real quick. This piece in, at resilience.org gives us seven reasons why decoupling won't happen. Rising energy expenditures. You know, we've used all of the uh, cheap sources of energy first. All future sources are going to be more expensive, although renewables may throw a little bit of a wrinkle in that. Uh, rebound effects that, you know, as we do increase efficiencies, we, uh, so far, we've always shown a propensity to use more of a resource. And instead of turning that efficiency into being better planetary citizens, we turn that efficiency into more trips to Cabo, <laughs> more big uh, rock concerts of more intercontinental air travel and that kind of thing. Problem shifting. This is an important one. Technological solutions to one environmental problem can create new ones or exacerbate others. And the Green Revolution, I gave you a good example of that already. Underestimated impact of services, limited potential of recycling. Don't get me started there. Insufficient and inappropriate technological change. Let's see. We need that one explained. Technological progress is not targeting the factors of production that matter for ecological sustainability and not leading to the type of innovations that reduce environmental pressures. And then cost shifting, that I guess is something I already mentioned where really what we do is we just export our footprint somewhere else. And so the accounting makes us think that decoupling is going on when in fact it isn't. Are you familiar with Ted Trainer? Have you heard of Ted Trainer? I have not. Very smart Australian. Of course. <laughs> for some reason, one of the smartest people in the room. And he actually posted a comment at resilience.org to this piece saying that decoupling is just not really happening. And Ted Trainer's comment I want to share of the detailed reviews and rejection of decoupling, this is by far the best yet. Uh, he said that the study has over 300 papers listed in the bibliography involving about 1,000 authors. It puts a knockout case, not just against the failure to decouple, but also for the reasons why technical advance, recycling, et cetera, are very unlikely to ever achieve the absolute decoupling required. The absurdity of the claim is easily demonstrated. The resource and environmental impact of the present level of global GDP is at least 70% beyond sustainable. But if the expected 9.8 billion people were to rise to the per capita level we in rich countries would have by 2050, given continued economic growth, resource demand would be around 30 times the sustainable level. So basically, Ted Trainer, you know, kind of anticipated this conversation uh, with Sam Harris about speeding up the poor getting rich. And there, are, again, I want to just underscore what you said, Erica, that it's not that we don't want the poor people of the world to have their needs met and to be able to live good lives. We just don't want them to repeat the same mistakes that we in the overdeveloped world made. Right. And actually the planet isn't going to allow them to make those same mistakes. Right. Um, it's about dispersing already what we have, but the problem is, is that a lot of people in the developed world aren't willing to give that, that up. They want their cake and they want to eat it too. <laughs> Going to put Andrew McAfee in the same container with them. I mean, here's a guy, he wrote this book. You know, my guess is I'm going to be his therapist, volunteer therapist here for a minute. He <laughs> desperately wants to believe that he can have that house in the Hamptons and that ski vacation in Switzerland and make a lot of money and live the good life. He really wants to believe that he can do that and that the planet will not suffer for it. Yeah. Sorry. And then spreading that message. I yeah. mean, he is a prominent figure. A lot of people probably do listen to him and take his word seriously and like social contagion, like that's just only going to spread. So back to Miss Greta, like that is why it is important to counter these arguments and to start that conversation in the reverse direction because it's it's just not true. And maybe that will lead to more people listening and actually starting to question the words of prominent figures like Andrew McAfee. 
No charge for this little bit of rain on your parade. <laughs> Erica and Dave are glad to rain on your parade today. Sorry, Charlie, <laughs> but you cannot have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> yep. I think this is relevant to the conversation. Erica, maybe you can fill us in on why it is, but we did want to talk a little bit briefly before we go about this piece called, uh, let's see, the headline was net zero carbon dioxide emissions by 2050 requires a new nuclear power plant every day. This was at Forbes, huh? written by Roger Pilkey. He's a political scientist and teaches in the environmental science department at the University of Colorado Boulder. Shout out. He mostly writes about policy and governance issues related to science and innovation. And his most recent book is titled The Rightful Place of Science, Disasters, and Climate Change. Okay. So who doesn't want a new nuclear power plant built every day? <laughs> I thought it was interesting because Pilkey talks about what is called the climate change auction of promises, which was described over a decade ago by Gwen Prinz and Steve Rayner as the tendency for politicians to vie to outbid each other with proposed emissions targets that are just not attainable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. I know we try not to discuss politics too much, but it's it's becoming harder because our goals for a sustainable future are becoming more and more intertwined with the political climate. And climate change has been a central topic of interest at the last three Democratic debates. We hear from each of the Democratic candidates about their promises to reduce emissions all the way down to net zero. But is this really realistic? We don't actually ask, how are they planning to do this? And Pilkey writes about why we should and why we shouldn't just accept for face value what these politicians are telling us. All really great candidates we have, but it's becoming a little bit difficult to see who's serious about this and, and who actually has that knowledge and power to actually get stuff done. Yeah. So yeah, Dave, what did you think about it? Well, so this guy does some analysis, you know, which is great. I mean, he crunches the numbers to say, okay, well, what <laughs> does it take to get to net zero? Of course, he makes one assumption that some people might have a problem with, and that is he does not filter into his calculations that we are successful at coming up with some technological miracles, carbon sequestration and storage. So we're not assuming any of that's going to happen. And, and that some of that may happen, but if it does, I think it probably is going to be a pretty small amount anyway. So I don't think that negates the conclusions that he reached. So he looked at how much energy we are currently getting from carbon-based fuels, from coal, natural gas, and oil. And then he also looked at our target economic growth to kind of calculate how much more energy we're going to be demanding from the planet in 2050, assuming that we have not decided we need to simplify our lives, but we've all been listening to Sam Harris and Andrew McAfee and think we can have our cake and eat it too. So he does the calculation. He says, okay, so what does that look like? Let's say we're not going cold turkey, but every day between now and 2050, we're going to give up you know, a percentage of that coal, oil, and natural gas produced energy. And every day between now and 2050, we're going to replace that. We're going to put in place renewable generated energy equivalent to that. So he came up with the nuclear plant as an illustration, which I think kind of tends to distract. But the, the nuclear plant illustration was we'd basically have to commission a new nuclear plant every day between now and 2050 to replace all of that energy that we're you know currently getting from carbon-based fuel. But then he, uh, fortunately, he did a, a comparison that I like better, which was uh, wind turbines. And so the bottom line of this story, and we'll include a link in the show notes, bottom line is to get to net zero carbon dioxide emissions by 2050, every day from now to 2050, we would need to eliminate the burning of 1.6 million tons of oil, coal, and natural gas to produce energy. And every day, we would need to turn on a 300 square mile wind farm with 1500 wind turbines to replace that energy. Every day, we would need to add 1500 wind turbines to the energy generating infrastructure of the world. If we want to can kind of continue business as usual, except go renewable or go nuclear. 
And that's definitely not being discussed at the debates. <laughs> no. Do I need to say it? You know, how realistic is that? Raise your hand. Anybody here think that we can add 1,500 wind turbines to the planet every day between now and 2050? Yeah, and that just kind of gives rise to how complex this problem is, is that we really have no idea. And we hear these things, myself included, when I don't know how many hours long on CNN, I was just happy that this was even being discussed. You know, of course, you have to ask, well, these are all nice. These are all great things that I'm hearing. But how the question of how are you going to do this comes up? I don't think any of them really honestly know. But if they knew what it would really take, they wouldn't tell us because you can't tell us the truth and get elected, unfortunately. Yeah. Right now. That's pretty much true. I mean, Jimmy Carter kind of proved that <laughs> on a real light scale when he did tell us the truth about our, the fact that we needed to turn down the thermostat in winter and put on a sweater and drive 55 miles an hour. And, uh, you know, he did not get elected to a second term. Yeah. Now, I think that's really relevant because this whole conversation about whether we can keep on chasing economic growth. Greta Thunberg, in fact, let's let's play that one sentence from her speech to the United Nations Climate Action Summit in September, where she mentioned economic growth. Yes. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? Yeah, I'm going to play that. All the time, because it's a fairy tale. <laughs> Continued economic growth, infinite economic growth, total fairy tale. And that's why I had so much a problem with uh, Andrew McAfee, because he basically has written this book saying, yep, you can have Cinderella and Hansel and Gretel and the three bears. It's all true. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it was kind of disappointing as well to to hear Sam um, also agree with him. And I like that podcast. Uh, I'm a fan, but that was just a really, just wasn't the best episode. Yeah, Sam, shame on you for buying that. I mean, you, these guys both sounded smart, but oh, yeah, you know, very... let that be a lesson to you. Just because they sound smart doesn't yeah. <laughs> mean that they know what they're talking about. Yeah. <sighs> okay. So we brought into the podcast with us for a few minutes, Dev Verat, who is a professor in the Liberal Studies Department and at the Institute for Sustainability and Department of Urban Studies and Planning at California State University, Northridge. That's a mouthful. You must be a busy guy, Dev. I'm busy, all right. Welcome to the show, Dev. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for joining us. We invited you to come on because uh, something got our attention, a piece that uh, was run in the student-run newspaper at California State University, Northridge, The Sundial, and the headline was How to Be Sustainable. You wrote a little introduction to it and said that you asked your sustainability students what CSUN students can do to live more sustainably. And this is what they told me. And your students gave you a really good list of things that students and human beings everywhere ought to be doing. That's right. We wanted to get the story from you on that. Well, I teach this class. I've taught it now for several years. And I have a bunch of standard exercises that they have to go through as, as well as assignments. So first of all, they learn a lot from the assignments. There's things like calculate your uh, ecological footprint, calculate your carbon footprint. And then they would go out and do measurements in wherever they live on how much heat they're losing, how much water they're using, et cetera. And so through those exercises, they, be, they start becoming, first of all, like really surprised at what they're doing. I'll bet. And then um, I always say, well, what's your reaction and what are you going to do about it? And some people are pretty happy with, with what they're doing, but other people say, well, I'm, I'm so shocked. And um, then they, they say they're going to try to do better. So it's kind of like all over the place. These are undergrad? Uh, yeah, it's an undergrad class. Although I let them in. It's supposed to be like upper division, but I, I let anybody in who's interested. Great. And it's housed in the liberal studies department? There's this thing called the Institute of Sustainability. It's not a college. It's an institute. It's supposed to be a standalone thing. And they were actually conducting classes. Well, then I guess that created some internal problems within the university. So they took the sustainability classes away from the institute and put it in the Department of Liberal Studies. Oh. But I still teach the same curriculum. I have the same, I have complete freedom. I coordinate with the institute. 
before I forget, I wanted to mention that they're actually starting a bachelor's degree in sustainability. That's new. It's great. I've been teaching this so long now. So when I first started teaching, it was only through the Institute. And this is reflective of what's going on in society. They might have heard about sustainability, but they didn't know much about it. Yeah. And um, but then over time, it be, you, now it's everywhere. Everybody always sees sustainable everything. Everywhere you go, you see the sustainable this, sustainable that. And so Us. they got on. <laughs> the, yeah, they got on board. And so even I, I also teach in urban studies and planning. I teach a planning class called Cities. And so they changed the name of the class to Sustainable Cities. <laughs> and the, every department's done that. They kind of incorporated sustainability into their existing courses. And with the Institute, right now you can get a minor in sustainability. And the way you get the minor is you have to take three core courses, which I teach. But then you can also have other courses to get up to a certain number of units. And those courses can be spread out throughout the different departments on the campus. Well, Dev, I think... You probably need to start teaching a new course, which is how to stop abusing the word sustainability. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And then we have conversations about that, too, is everybody's using the word, whether they're sustainability or not, they just plaster it all over everything. It's kind of like empathy in the psych department. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so we, we have discussions about that in class. And then, you know, I'm sure you've seen everything like sustainable olive oil or something like that. And it's really not, but they just say it is. They just label it just to get the marketing. Plus, everybody's busy trying to figure out how can we sustain our unsustainable behavior? Rather than changing their behavior, they want to figure out how we can sustain it. So it's it's crazy. <laughs> I've looked over the website and discovered the Institute. And that's, I mean, there's a lot of faculty involved. I mean, it looks to me like this campus is got some serious sustainability action going on. Yeah, I think we're number seven in the nation. I'm pretty sure that's the number. Wow. We have a director of sustainability and a sustainability plan for the campus. And every when you go around the campus, you can't just, you just can't get away from it. Wow, well, that's great. That's great. You could probably take some credit for that. There were a couple things on the uh, the list that the students came up with that really impressed me. Erica, especially you can guess, I was very curious to see whether anyone said anything about family size decisions. And sure enough, we have under take personal action to live more sustainably, don't have kids. That's even stronger than have one fewer kid or only have two or only have one. So uh, congratulations for not being afraid to talk about population topic. Obviously, you've addressed that in the class. Absolutely. I mean, the overall message in the class, and I'm sure you're aware of this, is it's kind of like we're on a train that's going off a cliff. We're all riding the train together, and we know it's going off the cliff, so what are we going to do about it, you know? And um, some students have signed up, and they said they're not going to have kids. Others probably, they probably are going to have kids. They just don't say anything. So I think there's a mixed bag on that. But they did put that on the list. It's huge. Yeah, I agree with Dave. I think that's wonderful. That is an aspect that you are touching on in your course and in your work because it's just neglected in the whole conversation of sustainability. So no, sure, no problem. And then, yeah, another professor that I were kind of like friends and we both teach the same course he actually brings in, I don't think it's a doctor, but he brings a guy come in to talk about clipping men. <laughs> so, <laughs> National yeah, Vasectomy right, Day is right. coming up. Or, or no, it, I'm sorry, so, Interna so, International Vasectomy Day. So or he world, actually, yeah, world. He's actually promoting that. Um, we, we joke around about that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I want to let you go because I know we're kind of interrupting your weekend and this was short notice. But two quick things. One is, I hope that you'll come back. We would love to have some further conversations with you on a couple of topics. One is you've got all of this uh, urban planning expertise, and I really want to do what I know is going to end up having to be more than one episode where we really talk about uh, the behavior of cities. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you are steeped in all of the mythology, the, the pressure from economic developers, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I'd love to have you back on that sure. score. Yeah. Um, the other thing about the futures, I wanted to mention that Erica is just down the street from you. You ought to invite her to come visit 
be a guest lecturer at your class or something, perhaps. Where is she? Where are you, Erica? Where are you? <laughs> I'm in Irvine. Irvine? Oh, yeah? Um, so it's yeah. not too far. Well, yeah. well, if you're interested, I'd love to have you if you're interested. Absolutely. Um, I would love to see kind of how you teach and that that would be an experience. And yeah, we should definitely stay in touch. That would be great. I would love to visit, observe. <laughs> It'd be your class. It, uh, no, no, not observe. <laughs> it's your, you, you'd be the guest lecturer. I'd be sitting down with the students. We're going to have to twist her arm a little bit. Gavin. <laughs> no, they would just talk to you. You know, they, they, I, I, I encourage them to just get into dialogues with guest lecturers. That is too cool. Great. Yeah, well, I'd love it. Let's definitely connect. I'm I'm certainly open to it. Yeah. Erica, you're going to have to ride your bike or take mass transportation over there. <laughs> <laughs> the train. The train is my favorite. <laughs> the train's actually pretty good. You know, I used to work in downtown LA yeah. and I used to take the train and just watch the cars go. You know, you're going faster than the cars and it actually goes underground. So you're really going, you're, you're going like 60 miles an hour underground and these cars are all stalled in traffic. It's honestly the best thing. That's great. Well, DevRat, thank you so much. We'll include a link to this excellent piece, How to Be Sustainable. Uh, we'll let you know uh, when this episode is going to be up. We hope you might share it with some of your classes. And I really will try to make sure that the conversation between you and Erica continues, because I'd love to see Erica get over there to the campus. And... <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dev. Okay. Thank <laughs> Take you. Care. Cool. Thanks again. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, we ought to probably bring this party to a close. Should we bring some positive news to uh, end the conversation? Why don't we end yeah. anything to celebrate these days? Well, now that you ask, this month, mayors from 14 major cities worldwide committed to slashing the amount of meat consumed by their constituents. Yeah, let's see. Barcelona, Copenhagen, Guadalajara, Lima, London, Los Angeles, Miami, Oslo, Paris, Quezon City, Seoul, Stockholm. Tokyo and Toronto. This is like worldwide change. This isn't just happening in one area. This is kind of everywhere. So I, I'm I'm very happy to hear that people are gathering together and talking about the stuff that matters. Again, I think it's really easy to say that reducing your meat consumption isn't going to make a big difference, but this is change. Like this, we're seeing it right now. This is individual action, like those students uh, wrote up in that piece that we were talking to Dev Verat about. And this is individual action, like uh, Greta Thunberg mentioned. Yeah. Like those kids are probably the biggest threat to ExxonMobil and the oil industry. And, you know, similarly, maybe all of these people will be the threat to the meat industry. So I knew you'd be happy about it because let's see, you are... You're not vegan, are you? You're vegetarian or neither? In the process. <laughs> I'm working my way. Yeah, I was formerly vegan and then um, college happened and, you know, you kind of eat for convenience when you're a college student. But yeah, I'm very happy about this and I'm also in, working my way into it. I think really cool too, Santa Fe's mayor, Alan Weber, recently designated November as Vegan Awareness Month. So what better motivation do I have than to uh, start there in November and just in time for the Thanksgiving holiday? There you go. <laughs> but what we don't know is how are these mayors going to make this happen? It talks about a pledge and policies, but I can't imagine that all these cities are actually going to make it so that your third burger has a extra $10 tax on it or something like that. Because basically their, their pledge is to reduce, not to eliminate meat products from the diets of their citizens, but reduce it to about two burgers per person per week. You know what? That's not a huge sacrifice. That, you know, everybody, if they don't want to go vegetarian or vegan, they ought to be eating less meat. That is one way to really shrink your footprint on the planet. And you know what? If a billion or two other people do the same thing, then it really will make a difference. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Agree. It'll be interesting to see if these mayors think that they're going to be able to force people to do it so that that would make happy all the people who think that they just need to be sitting on their butts and not doing individual action and waiting for the system to force them to do the right thing. There's probably just going to be some public awareness campaign and say, hey, this is a good goal. Help us achieve that, citizens of uh, Toronto or Oslo or Los Angeles. I'm guessing that's how it's going to happen, but we'll follow that and see. Making it kind of into uh, like smoking, you know, how smoking, they tried to get people to decrease smoking by with the whole DARE program. That didn't really work. But then showing the like 
those really creepy commercials with what is it like the cigarette and the throat commercials? I don't know what that was called, but that was terrifying. I like saw that. And I, I, I mean, I've never been a smoker, but that was enough to make me never want to be a smoker. So maybe showing the, uh, I don't know, more animal cruelty videos in the media in our future. Yep. So that's a good thing. So we'll include a link to that news blurb as well. And like I said, I'm going to include a link to that. What was the name of that podcast Sam Harris does, Making No Sense? Is that what that's called? <laughs> we'll include a link to that nonsense as well. Aww. He's going to have to dig himself up out of that hole. So. Poor Sam. <laughs> Sorry, I am usually a little more charitable, but they just sounded like they knew what they were talking about, you know? Sorry, guys. <laughs> Not going to happen. So that's kind of, you know, reality check you're going to get from the Growth Busters podcast. So thanks so much for joining me and Erica. I'm Dave Gardner. Erica Arias, thanks so much for your enlightenment, your perspective, and your laughter. Thanks, everyone. Don't forget to visit uh, growthbusters.org to explore these issues more and uh, share this episode with your friends. If you know Sam Harris, share it with Sam because <laughs> I don't want to just talk about him behind his back. But share it around because that's how we can get people more enlightened. We've got to undo all the damage that was done from making nonsense. Right on. All right, that's a wrap. Some may dream. To paint mountains and streams, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Some may just want more, but don't know what it's for, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution. They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather, but no, not us. We are the growth buster. Calling, 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 call the growth buster.